works. It works. The one it's, dude it's I good. talked to about it said, and we can get started after this, but the one dude I said, talk to, he said that there was, I don't think he'd read the book, but he was like, there's like a really climactic part. And then they end it. I was like, when he's like, when they go into the desert, pretty much. the hard questions what is your guys's favorite 80s movie oh i think we may have just been talking about it <laughs> no but i didn't yeah. know if you guys are gonna go with that or if it was the best we were talking about the date the dune we were talking about dune. yeah david but lynch's overall, dune is pretty it's pretty yeah. high on the list i don't know i would have to think i know you got dune on the brain but maybe there's got to be something else out there i mean i know what mine is It'd probably be empire strikes back. that's pretty good empire strikes One, uh, back. you know what can i can i go rocky which one's the one with clever lang is that three with mr t rocky three i don't know might be that rocky two wasn't it was that two no two two he fights apollo creed again right uh, i think it's three rocky three really good Empire I did, did really like that. Just confirmed yeah. Empire Strikes Back. What about you, Father? Uh, I think The Last Unicorn. Last Unicorn. Ooh, really good. That's actually a that's good a really choice. Good yeah, I think The Last <laughs> Unicorn. Yeah, for sure. I may have to go back and watch that with my with my oh, kids. Make sure you do. Also, make Batman. You, make sure you do. That's like a good Batman. Mm-hmm. We just yeah. watched The Dark Crystal. Dark. And that was like, yeah. they really loved that. That Jim Henson. Yeah. They really loved, oh, I'm going to go back and watch the last year. Yeah. Although, the 80s although, such good although Audrey, it's kind of weird, man. Yeah, <laughs> scary. It's creepy. Yeah. I think mean, you know what I'm talking about. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's odd. There's, there's some stuff there flopping around. It's like, that's yeah, there's weird. some things going that's on. Funky, there's definitely that's a funky puppet, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so it's so wild that you couldn't make we were just people were just different in the 80s people were just different man like you can't make any of these things today he talked about karate kit the other day exactly yeah you can't yeah. make them you can't make them it's interesting it'll be interesting to see if there's a a return if we get a little bit of a, it'll it may be a while before we get that though I don't know. yeah maybe a while I don't know. So you're there. You're there, looking like a uh, criminal masterminds, uh, stroking the cat there, uh, Andrew. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> he won't leave me alone. It's been a heck of a weekend. I can say that. It's been a heck of a weekend, and he's desperately needing attention. I guess. <laughs> so, um, okay. Um, yeah, we have. Okay, yeah. Let's talk about the Nicene Creed. All right. Favorite 80s movie? You guys want to knock that down? Because I'm going with Empire Strikes Back or Batman. That's it. You know, that's mine. Last I'm year. going I'm going Lynch's Dune. I'm going well, first Dune. of all, Batman didn't come out in the 80s, did it? it was like 89, maybe? 89, 88 or 89. 89. Yeah. The, the Michael Keaton, Jack Batman. Nicholson. Yeah. Yeah, it was like, yeah. Okay, like barely 80s. Okay. Yeah. All right. First, Empire Strikes Back. that's like the advent of the 90s because the whole dark brooding yeah. okay that's, that's super nice sure. but i mean empire strikes back was in 1980 so sure. i'm gonna count all of the 80s book your book back. ending you if it came out ending. between january 1st 1980 and whatever the opposite end is the, the golden age is between 83 and 86 there's no question about that like that's when it's that's when it's Did just amazing alien come out alien was the 70. first one's in the 70s mm -hmm. 79 alien. i think Aliens, aliens, aliens is probably 84 ish, 85 ish. You know I'm going to say aliens because aliens also then feels like an 80s movie. Totally. Well, the aliens is definitively movie. like an 80, like, yeah, with Hicks, like the, yeah. like the whole Hicks character, that's like a defining yes. 80s moment. 
That's yes. what I'm saying. So I'm actually picking a movie now that feels like the 80s rather than just technically being in. And, and forgive me, I know we're kind of we've like we've fallen into the <laughs> kind of like yeah. pop culture, but like the thing with Hicks is like there's that overt kind of like social comment, like like uh, social state, like not like it's like the pop culture statement where it's like you know game over, man, game, game over, over, man, yeah. Like, that's that's quite essential 80s because like you gotta think about like that could never have been done in the 70s because like right. video games was not part of the popular milieu right Whoa. so like right. But, so by the time it says game over that line was such a hit because it had already permeated culture so much mm -hmm. about it, you know what i mean mm -hmm. that's dope. yeah and that's that's the line that everybody remembers it's game over game man it's over, game over man. yeah game yeah over. yeah that's a good one so Good job, Andrew. I picked a good one. That's a very good movie. <laughs> and I mean, come on, how iconic is like the the loader suit, like fighting? No, the the, in, the entire movie. Yeah. Like yeah. Every, every single thing in that movie. You count at least. Is... There's like two mullets in that movie, right? There's got to be at least two mullets in that movie. If there's two mullets and big guns, I think that probably that's the '80s right there. I think there could be, or there could be no mullets. I feel like there's a mullet, and that speaks more to aliens being an 80s movie than anything I could think of. There's, I feel like that there's one. I'm sure I there is. Projecting it person. <laughs> well, if I'm projecting, I'm happy. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that projection. So, anyway, so let's move on to, let's stop talking about 80s movies, guys. Okay. All right. So I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's where we're at. That's where we're at. So the Son of God, the only begotten, say, begotten really, of the Father before all ages. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. But what I wanted to focus on really quick was just the Son yes. of God. And we can yeah. continue on in just one second because I kind of was thinking about this this week. It's like, I think... Isn't that like everything? I mean, I don't know. Like, obviously it's not, but in some kind of poetic way, the son of God. Like, it's just like right there. It's like, we are 100% proclaiming his divinity. Like, that is that. Like, and I kind of think that that's something that Father was talking about was a lot of people are okay with this. Like, Jesus was a rad dude. You know, he had like a really lot of good things to say, but where they get like, hung up on his a his authority and b his divinity his like his i am god so like i thought that at least taking just a second to like talk about maybe that for a second and then moving on because obviously it only gets better from there well i told you guys i i, I like the the context and maybe this helps chronologically like father i've always and i've been thinking about it a lot more lately like and it does get into the authority and divinity thing that it's like, of course, we can't know the why, but it's like, maybe if we could talk about the distinction of, okay, here's all these prophets that are sent to Israel, but it's like, something is either lacking or what's going on to where like, then here's, no, then here's like, God himself mm -hmm. showing up, like manifesting and the difference in the authority, I think to talk about like the difference in the authority, the divinity is obvious, maybe, or maybe it's not, but like the, the difference in authority between a prophet and, and like what's, I don't, I don't even know how to, how to express this, but it's like, it seems like either something's lacking or what's going, clearly Israel exists so that Christ can come. Mm -hmm. do, do you understand like what I'm asking? Yeah. Maybe I'm not being clear. Yeah, maybe. I, I think I maybe... Uh... You know, I think um, I think we kind of still have that problem today, though. I mean, there's a certain uh, world religion that you know their whole thing is, and if you if they catch you slipping, um, mm. yeah, if they catch you slipping, they'll they'll definitely make a point of it because they'll say that um, you know they have reverence for for Jesus. Uh, and his mother, and and you know they they have, they do in fact have greater reverence for the mother of God than most Protestants do, which is you know that's a sad statement. But um, 
their big thing is, you know, he's, he is, he is a prophet. He's a mighty prophet, you know? Um, and I think that this is really important because for us, um, and, and it's tough because there's, you know, there's certain, um, there's certain churches, Orthodox churches that have their roots uh, in the Near East that will tend to have a much more, well, at least from certain perspectives, too cozy of a relationship in regards of like, I don't know, I don't know how to say it, but just really compromising some of that, you know, calling this other world tradition an Abraham, you know, almost like, oh, the Abrahamic faith, like, like they're all on the same par. Um, and, and I, I just, I think it's really, um, it's unfortunate because, um, I'm not really, I'm, I'm all in and I'm not all in for a profit because, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not all in for a profit because if, if he's not God, then, you know, we, we have a major problem, Houston. So, um, so like there's, there's a huge difference in, and I think one of the things is that uh, the, the authority and the way that the prophets speak you can only really sense it within the tradition. Like the, the prophets don't really have any gravitas or weight outside of those who would be connected somehow to the quote unquote Abrahamic tradition, whether they be Jew, Christian or Muslim. It's like, there's no real weight there. But Christ, his words have weight with everybody, including his enemies, right? So to me, that's the evidence that, it, that you're, these are the words of God not just a simple prophet, right? Um, but I, I think it's interesting because we still have this, this thing today where it's like, I mean, I remember, I remember hearing this a lot growing up. This like, well, Jesus is the son of God, but not God. Oh. Well, Jesus is the son of God, but not God, you know? And, uh, well, that's a, that's a heresy. Yeah. No, it's for sure a heresy. And, and it's one of those ones where it's like, it's, it's the worst kind of semantic because it's just like you, it's just, it's painfully ignorant, um, but also understandable because so many people are really illiterate, not just in regards of the scripture, but in regards of theology and, and, and history and, and what it would have meant to, to make yourself equal with God, how, how scandalous that would be. So, you know, people, I've been coming back to this a lot. These I've, I've quoted him a couple of times this last week, but you know, Rene Girard, um, he, he's got such, I mean, he's great. He's, I can't say enough about Rene Girard, but like one of the things uh, that he talks about, which is very poignant, is that so many people, um, so many of the detractors of Christianity, all of the detractors of Christianity, they don't realize that, that they're standing on the shoulders of Christianity. Like the fact that they're even able like to have any type of involvement, any type of kind of like voice that, you know, why do you care about the victim? Why do you care? Like you care about the victim. You care about, um, you know, the, the marginalized, you care about, you care about all these things. You care about human rights, all this stuff. You care about it because of Christianity, period. Like period, you know? And this whole this whole notion of like, well, you know, morals without without Christianity, it's just it's absurd. Um, it's these what if questions um, are just they're absurd. So, anyways, uh, I think in regards of the the weight of the weight of the words of God, uh, Christ Jesus, as opposed to the prophets, it's just like, you know, the, the weight of the prophets' words again. Um, they have weight because they're pointing to him. Sure. You know, they have weight because they're pointed to him. Um, but there's also, I mean, it's it's the parable of the of the of the owner of the vineyard who sent his his you know servants first, and they were killed, and then he finally sent his son. And, and I think that, um, you know, it's interesting to me. And this is just a thought. This is. This is just pontification, just kind of like talking, but it's interesting to me the way that 
God validated his prophets through 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 the Christ, through his incarnation, because um, if you think about it, God could have done, I mean, we all know God could have done it so many ways, but the way he really just validates the, the prophets and um, validates his his calling on them, you know what I mean? Because it's um, it's one of the wonderful things about becoming biblically literate. Um, and, and what I mean is you don't have to become an expert, right? But just to whatever degree of where you're at, you become more biblically literate. One of the things that you'll just start discovering right off the bat is just how much of the words of Christ and his ministry is just pointing back to the prophets as a validation of who they were and that they were sent by God, that they were sent by him and that, that they spoke of him and that he is in many, in many ways, you know, affirming them. And it makes me think about, you know, he who's ashamed of me and my words in this sinful, wicked, gener adulterous generation, you know, um, and how he just affirms them before men and before angels. In his in his earthly ministry so, father yeah. father it, i i've i've often wondered and i mean maybe this gets to, to to some of what i was was thinking before is is and i don't i don't know if you and i have ever talked talked about this or if i've read anything where, where i felt that somebody was and and again i know this is something that can't be known but is there some idea that that perhaps Christ wouldn't have had to come had Israel and the world heeded the prophets, like all the way up to St. John, the forerunner, or, or is, or is the, the idea that Christ's coming was inevitable and that the prophets were pref prefacing it. Yeah. I mean, his coming was inevitable. Uh, the father's teach us coming was inevitable. Although I have to defer out of ignorance, I don't know in regards of specifically in, in correlation to the prophets. Um, again, I don't know. So um, back checkers, forgive me. Um, my intuition says that it's a little different. I think that the prophets are um, kind of a, a kind of condescension or, or a dispensation, if you will, because of Israel's um, disobedience. Um, but his coming was inevitable. So the prophets would show up when things were going bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The prophets are the, the prophets are there. You know, as I understand, exclusively because of the it's it's they are a a mercy. Um, of God, you know, being his mouthpiece to always call, because the, the prophets exist to call to repentance, right? That, that's why they exist. But, the, but Christ would, God was still incarnate, God will still have incarnated, become incarnated. But the prophets, they exist, they existed, that office of prophet existed because of the need for repentance. That's... So it's a, it's a little bit different. Are there still, I mean, I know that there are elders who give prophetic words and saints who, who have obviously, did, does, does the nature of prophethood, like does the office of prophet still exist after Pentecost or oh, is that? Sure. Okay. For sure. For sure. For sure. There's like weeping icons too, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you bring up a good point there, Andrew, because I, I would definitely say that the office of prophet has gone beyond I don't even know how to make the distinction like it's gone beyond the kind of like animated living human being to where an icon has a prophetic role um, which is very different like someone could say that the serpent of brass in that same way functioned which I don't think is far-fetched but like icons, miracle working icons, they are profoundly and exclusively prophetic. They, they are a call to repentance. Like it's one of those things where people, 
like we've been icons they're incredible you know and they're they're an, they're an encouragement uh to the people but they're also like a warning <laughs> you know they're a call to repentance and a lot of people miss miss that you know it's like if an icon starts weeping it's like lord have mercy you know um so does that so does that mean then that so you're saying if so so a weeping icon and it's a wonder working icon but at the same time while it's weeping there's there's a message that needs to be there's a message for the church of something yeah, that the church yeah, needs icons, to do yeah when icons start weeping it's like an encouragement but it's 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 an right like it's <laughs> You, you don't encourage someone who's doing great. Like in that sense, right? You know, you don't go like, hey, you, you're getting the gold medal. Like, you know, like the guy getting the gold medal doesn't need the, doesn't need the encouragement. Christ came for the sick, not for the well. When, when, when an icon starts weeping, a lot, I mean, a lot of Americans don't know this. Like it's, it's a sign of like repentance and like it's it oftentimes can be a portent of, of you know, I don't want to say doom, but um it's definitely doom. a it's definitely a call to, to repentance, you know. Um, it's okay to say doom. Yeah, I mean. And hey, Father, are there weeping icons right now? Perhaps. Oh, absolutely, there are weeping icons right now. <laughs> I was just with one. Uh, yeah. A couple weeks ago, yeah, the Ivron, uh, Our Lady of Ivron, the the Hawaiian uh, icon. Um, incredible. I mean, it's 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 just incredible. It's like weeping right in front of you <laughs> it's it's copiously it's it's incredible um i think that's sometimes i may have specifically talked about i think one of our first ones we talked about intellectualism how a guy can really know a lot about church history and stuff like that but like a weeping icon truly like is extremely challenging to a person to like see a weeping icon and to actually like see it and there's like no pump in the back it's nothing it's just happening and it defies everything you thought would be true you know and I how mean, that can really boggle the mind i mean yeah um the guardian one of the guardians um uh, of the icon he who was just I mean, God forgive me, he is just a wonderful, wonderful priest. Um, got to spend some time with him. Um, and I mean, it's just, it's funny hearing him talk about it because he'll say like, you know, even in his own kind of initial experiences with, with it, with, uh, with Our Lady, it's just like, your mind runs through all these kind of like rational, like, like how is this happening, how is this possible? It's just like, kind of like an automatic, Thing, you know um and it, it, it's it's interesting because i think um like so much with god um it's it's on a, it's operating on a different frequency you know um and and this is the thing i mean the prophets offered operated on a different frequency and obviously christ did you know and, and the things of god aren't any different you know they're operating on a different frequency, and it's um, it's truly mirac miraculous. It's but it's also truly mysterious, um, and it's you know um, it's one of those things where, to be really honest with you, um, Saint Nikolai Veronovich he, he talks about you know he talks about it a couple of times, but there's one place in particular I'm thinking about where he's speaking about you know not believing in God but knowing, you know, not, not believing in the sense of like, oh, you know, I, I believe this could be true, but like knowing, you know, like, like absolutely. Um, and I, I remember <clears throat> my first time seeing it in like 2007, 2008, it's the first time she had come to the mainland and um, just walking in there. And I mean, it's just overwhelming. The, the fragrance of her is so overwhelming, but then like when, when I saw her the first time, it's you're looking and the icon is just, you can see, you can see the myrrh forming and just running down, you know, and not just kind of like, was well, that kind of like the reflection of the light? It's just like, it looked like someone was pouring oil, you know, like there's an invisible spigot of oil just being poured 
uh, over this icon. So you look at that, and I just remember telling my, I walked out of there with my, my family, they were like two kids at the time. I remember telling my, my oldest son, I was like, and he wasn't even really old enough to understand it. You know, I just, it's more or less, I was talking out loud. I was like, man, I'm not even a Christian. It's just like, I thought I believed. Yeah. And walking in that and seeing that it was just, Lord have mercy on me. It, yeah. So, so, so th getting back to, you know, the son of God, it's like, um, there's all kinds of quote unquote kind of wondrous things that exist in this world. Uh, we got to be careful because not every quote unquote miracle is of God. But um, that being said, man, you know, the getting back to what I was saying, this, this is, there's no, <laughs> Jesus is God, you know, and, and, and that, that reality is something that you, um, you you experience in such a way that it never it doesn't have a shelf life, you know. And getting back to what I was saying earlier about his words and his words are not having a shelf life. It's like this; they are profoundly deep and, and eternal. The nature of them, the, the 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 savor of them is 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 eternal. So, the and the number of these types of things associated with Christ throughout history. There's like, there's nothing even close in any other tradition. Like you look at other traditions at like the, that, that claim to have some connection and it's just the real world, the number of real world things. And then as I talk to, to Orthodox now, they're like, it's, it's constant that people are like, oh no, this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing. Yeah, yeah. Like it's just everywhere. Yeah, you know? I mean, forgive me, for, forgive me. I just... You know, again, it is what it is. This is like an in-house conversation, kind of. But, you know, it doesn't go the other way around. Like, there's so many um, examples of the things of God and people of God. Things and people of God healing Muslims, atheists. I mean, I mean, the things of God are powerful and they, and they heal even the non-believer. It doesn't go. It doesn't go the other way around, though. There isn't some kind of holy Hindu site where you know Orthodox are flocking to there to get blessings and grace. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no Muslim like holy site where where Orthodox flock to to get a blessing. Like, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> there's no reciprocation there. They come to the. They come to to receive blessings from from our tradition, whether it be from the Mother of God or from or from one of the saints or a holy man, but it doesn't go the other way around, you know? Um, and so that's- Interesting things, point. But that's one of the things where I look at and go like, you're not gonna find it. You're, you're not gonna find it. And if someone says, aha, I found this one thing, I'll be like, yeah, but those people like, are they apostates? Or like, you know, like you just, you don't, you don't find it, you know? And another interesting thing too, is that, and I think that this speaks more to the meekness, humility, and just the strength of God versus any type of like weird um, syncretic, syncretic tendency, pluralism or, or ecumenism. Um, and that is so many times um, that gift is of, of blessing and grace is given, it's not contingent upon uh, converting. And I find that to be very compelling too, because you know, saying John Maxwellovich, he, you know, there's this Jewish woman who he healed, and she was like, "I want to become Orthodox." He's like, "No, that's yeah. not a reason to become Orthodox because you're healed," you know. Um, and the same thing with like, again, like uh, at St. Catherine's, you know, and and the work there, the in Sinai, and the the Bedouins there, they they had such deep veneration and in. in for the mother of God and, and for Christ. I mean, there's, there's so many other sites where Muslims will receive healing from a certain saint's grave or something like that. And it's like, you see this kind of like, there, it's almost like a, I, I'm a not, I'm, it's a non-threatened disposition of like, well, if you wanna, if you wanna participate in this, you have to become this. It's like, yeah, well, I, it, I, it rains on the just and the unjust alike, and that go, that even speaks to me that the 
the divine um, nature of be, not being anything like a man, you know, in regards of petty. Um, I don't know. It, it, it's it's. But that's it's that's also a different. Um orientation that this is one of the things that I've found different. And as people have, have spoken with me, like, especially people that I've known where they've been like, it, I, I think that expectation, like they're them being used to dealing with Christians, like the, in the United States, the Christians that they have known and Catholics even too, is that, um, no, you can't. There's no way that you can be blessed by our God mm -hmm. if you're not one of us. Like it would that I oh. think for I think there are many Protestants who are hearing what you're saying who are like, then that means then that means it's it's not of God because these people, how could they how could they receive it? How could a Muslim receive a blessing like, no, that would you can't receive any blessings. Right. Right. But 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 it's actually it makes way more sense that it's it's the other way because it's like. No, when he came the first time, there were no Christians. <laughs> like he he came and there, it was Jews. There was Gent like there well, was pagans. Well, I mean, I mean, because the other thing about it too is like here's one of those things, right? Everyone's gonna be resurrected. Like that's one of those things people don't think about or they don't know. Like yeah, everyone's gonna be resurrected. You know, like everybody, <laughs> everyone, everyone participates. In the resurrection of the dead, um, and and that's because of Christ, and that's 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 part of His work, you know. Like He freed and liberated mankind, like all of mankind, you know. Now, not everyone will will taste of the heavenly fruits. Not all will will receive that deifying love and light, but the but everyone will will, will be resurrected. You know. Will so, any will any non orthodox partake in that well <clears throat> we know that god is merciful and i think that i i think it's fair to say that anyone who is willingly defiantly <laughs> uh refusing to to i mean every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess i'll put it that way um and and i think that in the sense that anyone unknowing, anyone unknowingly, and anyone out of a, like an honest conviction in God will know their heart. Um, when they are shown their error, then you know God is good and merciful. You know, um, but this is this gets into the issue of um, which it's tough, but knowing like a, a knowing willful rejection and. I know the arguments and people say, well, actually, like, so maybe someone never truly knows. Well, I don't know about that, you know, because the fathers are clear about, uh, especially if St. Paul talks about in the book of Hebrews, but the fathers are clear about those who have tasted of the grace. Um, there's no, you know, and they, they leave off of that, that mercy and that grace. It's woe unto them. It's better that they would never came in the first place, you know, um, but in regards of those who, who are ignorant, um, you know, I feel very comfortable, um, and there are many fathers who would echo this sentiment that you know, God judges people according to the light that they've received. Um, so, you know, kind of, yeah, yeah. Kind of I recently have been encountering, and it's interesting because. Uh, one of the people in Bitcoin Mystery School, he just, maybe it was today, it's within the last 48 hours, let's say, he just, he's down in Dominican Republic, and he just actually, it was funny, because he, or, or maybe providential, whatever, but he put up a message where he said, you know, I'm running into people who are, like, atheists, they say they're atheists, and, and it's interesting, because I just had a recent interaction with somebody who 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 I know, kind of a, a libertarian, um, let's say podcaster or whatever, and had kind of a, a back and forth. And at one point he said something like, because he was, he's like former Christian, let's say Protestant, mm -hmm. probably evangelical. 
And at a certain point in the conversation, you know, we, we went through and he was talking about how the God of the Old Testament is the bad guy and all of this. And he was like, you know, judging whatever I'm, he said something like, I'm more good than your God. And I said, whoa, that's a, that's a really, that's a wild statement. I told him that's a huge signal. You should probably like, you may want to meditate on that a little bit, but come, come to find out that it's like, it's not, these people aren't atheists. And this is what this guy had said. They're like anti-theist. And he was very wow. open that he was like, you know, I was in church. I had these, these experiences and it was through reading the Bible that I came around to being like, God is not a good, per- good guy and all of this. And I think that to, to me, that it seems to me that that could only be an indication that you are not actually in contact with Christ. Because I haven't met anybody who's like, I've had an experience of Christ, but yet I lapsed. And, <laughs> and now I'm like anti-theist. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, oh, this isn't a good analogy um, for so many reasons, but I'll just use it anyways. Um, but it, it's kind of like, and, and I, I'm the only reason why I use it because it's real, right? It's, it's a real example. You know, I've had this phenomenon of, of encountering people and um, whatever someone wants to say about it, but I'm like the quote, quote unquote, first black guy that they've ever met where it's like, oh, okay. It's like, I, I don't know. It's like they've lived in a cave somewhere and the only experience of, of, of a black guy they've ever had was like watching cops or like young TV raps or something. I don't know. And um and so anyways, they, they end up talking with me and I've had this experience so many times and they're, and to whatever degree, thanks be to God, you know, um, it's changed their opinion. And so what I'm trying to get at is um, for a lot of people, they have this straw man that they have uh, of, of Christ through TV, through whatever, you know, and, and, you hear a lot about this too. You, you know, I hear this all the time, these lapsed Catholics. Um, well, you know, I, you know, I had the nun hit me on the hand with the ruler and uh, like all this stuff. Like they told me not to read the Bible. Just all this, all these things. I'm just like, you know, you're, you're trying to tell me about something that happened to you when you were six years old, which is more filtered through your disgruntled mom than, yeah. than you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, forgive me if that's your experience, but that's just what I've seen. Uh, because to your point, Cyprian, what they've never really had is an encounter with, with Christ. Um, and I know for some people, they're like, well, that sounds really Protestant of you, blah, blah, blah. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's a qualitative difference um, when you've encountered Christ and, and you know, the organism of the church for, versus the organization of the church. Um, Ooh, that's big. That can you can you dig a little more into that because that's something that a lot of people I, that I I am I am not down because people are like you don't seem like the type that would be into like they're like you're really into this 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 church <laughs> and they're like but you're so like this doesn't make any sense for you because because they're seeing the organ they're like you would not you would not be down with the organization. And I'm like, you're right. I'm down, but I am very down with the organism, which had been missing from my experience. Yeah, yeah. And and I mean the organism and the experience of the organism in, in the living church is an experience of Christ and Christ through his saints and Christ as he's revealed himself through Holy Scripture and through ecumenical councils and through sacraments. I mean, um, and and to be honest with you, um this aspect of organization versus organism, uh, it, it's, it's probably um, one, of the, one of the top, if not the top pitfall for people. Because the Lord even said this himself when he talks about build your house upon rock and not upon sand. Um, and I heard this interpretation of that, of that, of that parable years ago. And so I can't even really give, I can't give too much credit to where I heard it from or rather the validity of it. But for me, it resonates true in regards of if you see sand as people, 
And there's this uh, alluding to the nations as sand. Um, it makes total sense because the thing that you find over and over and over again, it's like, how do you explain, um, you know, I, I look at a situation and I go, forgive me for the sounds, and I've heard so many examples, but like, hear these terrible stories of like, oh, well, this priest treated me this way, or the church did this, did that, and I go like, yeah, I mean, I've had bad and even worse experiences than some of the people I, I've seen some people leave, quote unquote, the church and quote unquote Christ for stuff. I'm like, you left over that? You're like, Absolutely. like, you, like, you're like, you've been treated worse at, you know, at, at Costco, you're still going there, you yeah. know, <laughs> like what's, but, but, but the thing is, is they, they have not had a real encounter with, with Christ. And um, it's very easy to um, stop short, uh, as Sartre would say, you know, to start kind of like stop short and just look at the, what's visible and what's kind of like apprehendable um, but I, but I would submit that that's precisely the problem, because when the storm comes and it will, you know, whatever you're building won't stand. Um, and this, this function of the organ of the organization, it's one of those things where I don't even, you know, some people say, well, it's just a kind of like a, a an evil, an evil necessity. I don't even know if it's that, if that's the case. To be honest with you, because one of the things that you find is um, when you get around people who love God, who love Christ, um, you'll find that there's a very, there's a common thread I have found, um, whether they have been Arabs, Serbians, Americans, Russians, women, monastics, clergy, lay people, there's a common thread I found, which is when I encounter people who have a genuine love for Christ, there's a genuine um, humility and deference to the other, which is so, it's just consistent. It's consistent. And it seems to me that when that's lacking, that's indicative of someone's lack of experience of Christ. Not to say they haven't experienced Christ to some degree, right? But this, the people I found who, who have just had this profound and deep love for Christ, this is, this is a common thing that, they don't need the organizational organizational structures um, and the way that people a number one think that they would or or you know b number two how they would even it doesn't even dawn on them if, if that makes sense they almost see it as kind of like kind of gets in the way sometimes um, and I think this is one of those those weird paradoxes where people will kind of like they'll scratch their heads um, it's like uh, I remember when I first came to the church and I was an inquirer, I was, you know, getting ready to be made a catechumen and Father Michael, my, uh, the parish priest at the time, uh, my first confessor, he was like, orthodoxy is all about freedom. And I remember looking at him like, what? And, and in my own ignorance at the time, which, you know, I mean, just inquiring, like you look at the at the structure, you look at the discipline, you look at the um, the order and you think freedom. No, no, no. This is all about like discipline and, and strictness. And it's just like every year I go like, yep, orthodoxy is all about freedom. And, it, and it's, it's one of those crazy um, paradoxes. Um, but it really, it, it makes sense when you begin to unpack this reality of the, the living organism um, of those holy of men and women who are imbibing and um and to be frank to some degree projecting the, the christ through them they are part of they are the body they are the body they are the means in which christ is manifesting in the world um and the organization is the the way in which they capitulate and and um show mercy to the world that it's like it's like the <laughs> you know you you've seen like the, the the puppy or the cub that's just like going for and tearing at its mom and the the like the the lioness is just like uh like you know this 
this lion cub is trying to do everything it can to tear out. It's just like, oh, okay, you know? And I just, that's how I see the saints sometimes. It's just like, yeah, these things, these, these organizational aspects and facets, like they put up with it, they deal with it, but it's just like, and, and that's why with all this nonsense that we are enduring right now, this is, this is I think, what, what keeps my, what keeps me at bay is that ultimately when I have lost my peace, it's because I've lost my peace about the situation. Christ, when, it, when he's ready, he's just going to blow this stuff through like it's nothing because the reality of the organization being sick, that's what these last year and a half has been to me. It's, it's, it's really bringing, bringing up to the service the impurity of the organization and the way in which the world has tried to, you know, barnacle itself to the church and the way people have allowed that to be the case. But the living organism is not threatened by it. I think, Father, this, this kicks off for me this, this, the, the other thing that I was interested in talking about when we're talking about this concept of the sun, because it was something that you introduced me to early on in our relationship. I think before, I, I don't know at what point it was official that I was a catechumen, probably from the first time we <laughs> spoke with each other, but, but I know that you, I know that you, this is something that you introduced to me and I know it's uh, St. Nikolai Vilimirovich. And then I also found an allusion to it. Uh, I, I believe it's St. Saint, Saint Basil, Mm -hmm. as well it's in the catholic catechism but this you introduced to me this idea of the relationship to god of the servant the mercenary or the soldier and the son and this this one was like a big slave is better. slave is better though it's the slave the slave yeah. okay the slave the mercenary and the son yeah i think that's i think those are good um it seems to me, like as we're talking about this, and I think it's a good segue, that as we're talking about this, and I'm not going to bust anybody out because some, so, someone close to me made a comment like, eh, just, we get it. You don't need to, you don't need to call us out specifically. We, under, we understand who you're talking about. Just maybe don't say it. But it's like <laughs> certain, <laughs> let's, just say, let's just say there are certain organizations mm -hmm. where the, the faithful, or, or maybe it's like this. Maybe you can't be anything but a slave or a mercenary if what you're focused on is the, or, is the organization. Mm -hmm. Because how could you be a son to an organization? Mm -hmm. Right? And it's like, and I, it's, it's funny because I, I see it that it's like very much a slave mentality towards the organization. This is coming down from the top in this organization. They want to talk about the organization all the time, the things that the organization is doing. They want to say, oh, I'm either... Yeah, you know, a slave to it or no. And then maybe there's some legalistic way that I can finagle my way into something else and th this, that, and the other. And it's more mercenary in that regard, but there's just the sun piece mm -hmm. is missing. And so I was hoping that since we're on the sun, that maybe you could talk about this concept because this one was like, this one was huge for me. And it's something that I carry into prayer and throughout my, it's like front of, it's been front of my mind literally 24 hours a day since you brought it to my attention yeah i mean well remember too the great kicker is that which this <clears throat> excuse me brings us back to what we were saying earlier about you know the the absolute generosity and mercy of god in healing even those who would be his enemies you know muslims and, and non-believers you know um because he accepts all three of them <laughs> he accepts the slave and the mercenary or the, or the servant or soldier or whatever and, and but ideally you want to be the son you know and, and the slave the slave will will operate out of fear right and this is the person who has some awareness and then just like i don't want to go to hell or you know I, i'm just i don't want to suffer i don't want to suffer evil you know and this is the slave operating out of fear um and there's almost like a uh, kind of a, a compelled uh, a compelling there in, in a different sense you know uh and then the mercenary or the soldier you know he uh 
he's operating out of the reward. He 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 is gone enough to know, and he he sees and experiences enough, and understands enough that there's a reward in serving the king. That there's a reward, you know. That and this is the this is what you find with people who, um, you know, oh yeah, you know, like they they get the blessings, and you know, God, you know, will do this for me, do that for me, you know. Uh, Maybe not quite prosperity doctrine, you know, but something along those lines of, you know, the goodness of God, the goodness of God, and you, and you serve God, he'll do good things for you. But then there's there's this place where you enter into and you transcend those things. And this is where this is this is where it's at, which is the son. And the son does what he does purely out of the love of his father and to please his father, you know. And this this is important because, you know, uh, a slave can potentially inherit, can 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 potentially uh, participate in some of the inheritance of of his master. Uh, a, sir, a mercenary, a soldier can potentially participate in some of the the spoils of the the king who he went to war for, but the son is of his father right he is of his father and all that the father has is his and to the son that's so much more than his land his properties but it, it's it's his life it's his wisdom it's his strength it's his name um and, and this is so important so profound because again for a lot of people and, and a lot of a lot of the stuff, uh, you know, some of the things you, I don't know if this is too cryptic, but some of the stuff you sent me this last week as I went through it, you know, I, I um, it's good. And again, for me, the thing is God accepts them all. God accepts the slave, the mercenary, and the son. But it just, it's so clearly in that mode of mercenary, you know, it's just like, oh, this is, this is clearly better than what we're doing. You know, there's must be, there's this kind of like cool depth and profundity to this orthodox thing. And that's cool. That's, that's much better than this kind of dry materialist perspective we've had, but it's still very much a mercenary um, because it's still dealing and, and looking at the things of God in a temporal mindset. It may not be materialist, it not be materialist in the, in the exclusively in, in a more kind of obvious sense, but it's it's temporal. It's still looking at like there's a better way to do this, you know. Um, well, people want like some, they want some relief from the temporal. I've seen this as well. Like they see things bad in the temporal, they want some relief. They're sort of casting about yeah. because there's no materialist and they're like oh well maybe but yeah it does seem like what they want is they just want the bad stuff to stop they don't actually want to be transformed yeah. so okay. that they can like proceed through this as yeah. a different person yeah which is it's funny because um and the one we were talking about in particular i mean the pattern i see is it, it, it and it's funny because it was actually even mentioned overtly but it's like it is a very much a, a kind of spirit of Tower of Babel. And, and I think that, um, you know, this, this awareness of being able to, to use God and to see God just as a means to um, kind of more esoteric or a, a more, um, I don't know, insightful way of seeing, you know, organization and structure, like uh, existential, like philosophy, like all this stuff. It, it, it's still, you're, you still come up to this place where it's like, you're not dealing with the sun. You're not, you're not dealing with the sun. And when I mean sun, I mean the person of the sun. And, um, and that's still hard for people. I mean, some people will, they'll be like, and this gets us back to Peterson, right? It's like, yeah, I can get down with seeing God as like, you know, this um, broader construct by which to understand reality. And, and, 
and yes, that's there. But they have to stop short where it's just like, yeah, but once you start talking about it, what's like you're actually worshiping like a god, that's where I'm just that's where you lose me. And that's and that's always where you will lose people. Um, that's where you lose a lot of the mercenaries, is that you begin to realize that um, it is we're not talking about the force, we're not talking about the kind of power within us, we're talking about God who is unoriginate outside of us, eternal, um, and, and his, his only begotten son, which everything that the father is, he is as well. And, and this, this is a very interesting thing to me because part of the thing we are always dealing with, getting back to this straw man thing, is people's projection of who Jesus is, people's, um, and I don't know, this, this thing of becoming more biblically literate. Um, I don't even, want, I'm not even going to use that because I think, I think if I say that, it's going to get more impression. Let's just say more familiar with the scriptures. Not even more biblically literate, but more familiar with the scriptures. You'll start seeing that, you know, Christ as he reveals himself and as he's revealed in the scriptures, definite personality and definite, not who you think he is. Um, both ways, you know, and I think this is really important because the, the, the tendency to just see some sort of archetype as like Christ is like the ultimate archetype and everything, he's like the ubermensch in some ways, right? And everything will kind of fit, you know, it's totally, it, 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 it's really problematic because it's what they're missing is um, everything is, I was thinking about this today, leading into the conversation, everything is pointing to him, but, it, but that, that doesn't go the, that doesn't go the other way around. Right. I mean, that's, I feel like that's a theme. That's the theme that's coming up tonight. Right. Is that um, everything, like whether it is, you know, we're talking about the pre-incarnate logos. Right. So even, before he incarnated Jesus of Nazareth, like as the son, the logos, he existed, right? And so we see a, a, a ray of him in, in the teachings of Lao Tzu, you know? Mm. We see a ray of him, uh, I mean, even, you know, I, I'll be one of the people, I'm just saying, you know, you see a ray of him in the hymn to the Eitan with um, Akhenaten, you know? You see him everywhere, but it doesn't go the other way around. And, and that's another thing about the son of God that like you, you start to suss some things out because it's like, yeah, I can see this is what this is what St. Nikolai is great about. Like seeing Christ in all these ancient expressions, but it doesn't go the other way around. Like what, but once you've come to him, it's like he is the he is the full revelation. Like that's it. Right. Well, it's the difference between meeting someone in person and having heard about them, right? Like their reputation. It's like, oh, yeah, I've heard about you before. But then you meet the person and it's it's like, well, that thing, the, the reputation thing is like, okay, I get it. Like you say, there's like a, a glimpse in there of what they said. But like the real person is multidimensional. Right. That was for like one of that was. I've told this, I've said this to a few people, but it's really one of the things that brought me to Christ was I realized that while I was familiar with the gospel stories, I had never sat and read one of the gospels all the way through as a narrative, trying to see what they were saying about Jesus Christ. And I was, I, in doing that, I realized how absolutely ignorant I had been because I was like, oh, this is not I because I had been operating, I think, for many years under that sort of that straw man of Christ is the archetype and this and like pulling snatches from out of it. But then like seeing the story, like you say, the when the personality comes through, because how else could you interact with the person if you're like unaware of the personality of the person mm -hmm. that you're dealing with? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it, it's a lot like 
Yeah, I've heard of that guy, Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, yeah. And then when you finally meet him, you're like, oh, you know? And and it and it you'll see how much and how faithful your hagiographers were. You know, it's like, I heard so much about you. It's like, oh wow, it's great. And it totally makes sense. Or it's like, I heard so much about you, you're nothing like what I've heard. You know what I mean? That's that's the thing. You know, that that's the thing. And it's interesting to me because um this is another aspect about orthodoxy um which the saints every saint is one piece of the mosaic right every saint reveals some facet of 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 christ um in the same way just like you have this huge mosaic made with hundreds of thousands of pieces of glass and each one is unique in its in its own sense, but together it reveals this huge mosaic of, of of the king, and it's it's very true because that's why, um, for us, it's like you have to read the lives of the saints if you really want to experience the life of Christ in the church because the saints are the ones who live out the gospel. The saints are the one who. Who revealed to us the the connective tissue that isn't necessarily as um, plain spoken as as for instance a lot of evangelicals and Protestants think, you know this idea that you can just pick up the Bible, read it, and you get it. It's like, I mean, I used to think that myself too. And then when you start reading lives of the saints, you're like, whoa! So that's what that meant. Yeah. You know, it, it's a very different, very different experience. One of the things I wanted to ask was, you had mentioned a while ago that uh, people start fleeing when they actually start experiencing the real Christ. Like mm -hmm. there's this like, and I've experienced that myself, like, oh crap, it's real. And then, you know, like you kind of turn around and immediately like, find some way to make that go away, I guess. And I wonder, like, I think it's a pretty fundamental problem with humanity i think if not the problem capital t but like why do you think it is that people's immediate reaction when actually experiencing christ so say and i know nothing about this guy you guys talk a lot about him but i don't really know a whole lot about jordan peterson but it seems like at a certain point from when i understand the narrative he turned around and was like i can't do this like the you know or when it he's explicit about it Okay. He's explicit about it. Like he's explicit about several experiences where he's like rejected it. Yes, it was there, rejected it outright. Mystical experience. He's pretty. I think your mic went out for just a second. I didn't hear the last part of what you said. No, he's open about it. He's very okay. open about it. Okay. So why do you think that that is? Are the ramifications just too mind boggling? Because I know that that's what my hang up is. Obviously, I continue to go to church. I continue to seek Christ and emulate him to the best of my ability. This is not rejections. I heard a long time ago that God is merciful to an extent by not revealing himself. Because every time he shows himself, we just think of all the bad stuff we've done. And that's absolutely 100% what happens to me. Is most of the time when I have one of those mystical experiences, I just start thinking of all the bad things that have happened to me. Um, but so Joe Schmo is really starting to get kind of closer and closer to the chalice, you know, just starting to get closer and closer. And at a certain point, something happens, he turns around, broadly speaking, from a grand narrative throughout history. Why do you think that that would be father? Because I mean, supposedly, I mean, this is the thing we're all looking for. This is the person we're looking for. This is that person that every time we look to our right, to your left, we want them to be there. This is that person who would be able to say the kind word to us to hear that's exactly what we need to hear that's the that's like I tell my wife it's like that's the one notification that changes my life like I'm always looking on my phone for that one notification that's just going to change everything forever and it's like that is it like that's the thing that happens so why is it suddenly people's instinct to turn around and run from that yeah I mean it's a mystery right um, we are created with freedom. We are created with in such a way that um, our freedom 
necessitates our, an awareness of ourselves. Um, but I think you see this over and over again. This is, you know, Moses coming down from receiving the tablets and he needs to wear a veil over his face because, you know, the glory of the Shekinah is just so bright that people can't stand to see him unveiled. You know, this is, um, this is the touching of the ark unworthily and, 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 you know, being struck dead. You know, this is, um, but this is also the touching of the hem of his garment and being healed of an ailment of 12 years. This is also crying out, you know, and, and once you are healed, and you can see you cry out, Jesus, and a God have mercy. You know what I mean? Like, like this is, this. it's both. It's both and. And the, the reality of the awareness, again, this, I think we talked about this one of the earlier episodes, but it's like, learning not to flinch and learning to understand and experience the holy. Um, and, and, you know, this is, it's one of those things where it's not a dogma, but, you know, there's, there's a few fathers who teach St. Nikolai, one of them, you know, that um, when we, Basically, when the when the number of, of believers and the number of Gentiles or believers, whatever, um, fulfills the number of the, the fallen ones, then it, then it's then it's 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 a wrap, right? That what we're that what we're experiencing, what we're waiting on, is that those who are born into the kingdom are those who are replacing the fallen angels, you know. And um, this makes a lot more sense when you start to think about. And I think about this all the time as a priest, like people who, you know, my flock and people who I love, you know, but who are, um, it's like their eyes are open. They've been baptized, been chrismated. They've tasted the sweetness of Christ, but it's like, and you hope it's just a moment of running. You hope it's just a moment of an elapsed moment, but you know, you also begin to know that like, you know, one week can turn into one year, man, uh, totally. running from Christ, and then nothing's guaranteed you. And um, and that running away, um, it's a real thing. I mean, you read the old, you read the New Testament. There's there are those who walked with Christ no more. I mean, Judas betrayed him. You know, one of his his inner. So this is this is the reality of what we're dealing with, and as and in some regards, it doesn't have anything to do with God. It has to do with us yes. and, what, and what we are Yes. And, and, and who we are. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Like that's, that's, our I mean, that, that's to me, there's a couple of things I look at. Um, and one of the things that I look at, none of it's, none of it's guaranteed, but one of the things I look at where I go like, this person's going to make it, um, is when I see that someone's able to stop blaming God for things. When I look at someone, I go like, I've seen them have enough, enough experience and they, they no longer blame, like, why is God doing this to me? Or like, blah, blah, blah. You know, now to ask, what does God want from me? You know, okay, great. But like, like, you know, this kind of, this blaming of God, um, people who leave off of that, it's a very hopeful thing, right? Um, because they begin to they begin to realize how much responsibility we have in this thing, and how God is doing everything for our good, he, especially the things that are painful, right? This gets back to what Cyprian's talking about in regards to the son. Like, I love my children. Everything I do, from <laughs> forgive me for jumping jumping the shark right now but like um i was watching this interview with this ufc fighter uh israel Adesana, and um he's talking about how his dad is his manager um and he's like look you know like who better his dad's for the combat is his dad's a very successful businessman right so he's not like some fool with money but he's like 
who better to handle your business than the one who's going to be looking out for you for the sake of you, you know? And there's something to be said for that. There's something to be said for the fact that, um, you know, the son is, is aware that, you know, the father does what he does out of love, especially chastening, you know? And this is the thing about Jesus, the son, is that um, one of my, St. Sophroni, he says, this is the heart of the liturgy. And, um, you know, we're painting, you know, doing the iconography in the church right now and uh, in the altar and the sanctuary to the, uh, one of the main icons in there is the Garden Gethsemane. And it's like the centerpiece because it's like this space in which Christ offered himself and said, not my will, but your be, yours be done. Um, that's, that's, that's the sun. That's the sun. That's so, it's so hard, Father. Like this, this is, this is a hard one for me. And it's the reason why it's, like I say, it's been front of my mind since you introduced it to me is that, like you say, the rewards for the mercenary are, are, are there right? Like th that was something that was, a, that was actually profound for, for me. Like I'm still, I, I will be straight up. Like I, I greatly desire to be the son, but if I'm honest, which, which I have to be in this regard, because who am I fooling? It's I'm the mercenary. I would say 90% of the time, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes I'll be like, Oh, that was a, that that was a sun move and 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 I, I feel and I feel closer right. so much of the time it's like like it's because the in like and and to, to Andrew's point every encounter every encounter with Christ in my short but very intense experience of this whole thing has been a demand like and it's not a demand that he's making but it's I I immediately know what the demand is of how, how I need to, it's, I guess it's repentance, right? That it's like, okay, something is revealed that it's like, oh, yes, you are failing in this regard. And it's like, I know that if I do it, that if I go through very mercenary, right? That like, he will sustain me. But it's it like, I, I, I there is, there is the struggle of, and I, and I, 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 so I guess it's only going to come through God's grace that I'll, that, that it's going to be like, as a father, like, no, this is for your own good. Right. Not, not like, not like, oh, do your chores and then you're going to get your allowance. You yeah. know what I mean? That's yeah. very much what it feels, feels like a lot of the time for me. I mean, I'm a paladin. Yeah. Yeah. A paladin, man. You know, lawful good. Um, I thought of that joke like a half an hour ago, but I just wanted to say it just now. But this is the book of Job. You know? Uh, and, and it's one of those things where I would say to someone, and again, whatever, I'm just a country bumpkin priest, but um, I would say it's the reason why the Holy Spirit, you know, inspired the book of Job. You know, why God inspired the book of Job. Because in the book of Job, you, you see very clearly this, um, I mean, it, it's the highest of, of human experience in regards of this relationship to your creator, to your God, to your maker, to your king, to your everything. Um, and it's one that's, that is proven and tested. And, and I mean, how, like, in a, in a weird way, uh, I don't know if I'm going to formulate this correct, but it's like beyond the beyond the, every story is pointing to Christ, right? I mean, the story of Christ is the story, but there's something so profoundly different and so 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 deep about the story of Job and this this suffering though he slayed me i will still worship him like it's 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 profound you know 
Um, and I think that the the putting off of the that's that's explicitly what's named, you know, Satan, you know, the accuser, he says, Well, of course he worships you because you've given him all his stuff. But you take away stuff. Mercenary. You, he's a mercenary, man. He's a mercenary. You take away all his stuff, you take away all his stuff. It's like he's gonna curse you to his face, just like I did, right? The, essentially, that's what Satan would say, just like I did, you know. Is that like the end of the sentence? Is that like the end of the proper sentence? What should have been said? Well, that's, that's what should have been said, you know. Yeah. This is what's, what should have been said, you know. And and this is and and you could almost say this is just me, whatever, you know. Um, but you could almost say, and that's why Christ came for us as Job, because like no angel did that. No angel would have done that. Like that's that's the thing we're like because Job succeeded in that sense, you know, um, in some ways, Job is a, Job is in some degree, like a, a Christ-like figure in regards to his humanity, in, in contrast to his divinity, right? It's like, Job shows us what it means for a human to, to long and to be faithful to, to the divine and to God. Um, that it is possible for humans to do. He, he gives us that example of what a son looks like, of what a, of what a creature looks like, a creature of God. So, um, and to me, is that not inspiring? To me, is that not, um, is that not what it means to be human? To, to go above and beyond just the kind of rote, you know, perfunctory responses of survival? Because to me, that's one of the big problems with the mercenary aspect. It's like it's it's still fundamentally like animalistic. It's survival. You know what I mean? You, a no dog, doubt. No a doubt. Probably loyal and faithful because you get the meaty bones. You know what I mean? I don't know. So then, probably the missing ingredient between the mercenary and the son, one of them anyway, would be love. I mean, because, yeah, like, how common is the trope of whatever it is, I'll pay you double. Whatever he's paying you, I'll pay you double. Like, that's all it takes for a flip. But if there's no loyalty there, if there's no, like, love, then, you know, there's no, there's no, I don't know, the image, it goes one way. Like, yeah, I mean, it, forgive me, I, I just, I'm talking a lot tonight, but. And I'm not making any sense, I don't think. But I think no, you are. You you are. I, I I think the thing is, is like, and this is what I would just, you know, it's so important that we understand this now is that this time that we're in, which is about to take another term and get very bleak, uh, potentially. Um, it's it's for a reason, and it's like you better believe that those who are faithful to him, that we, that we win because he won. It's so important to understand that because it can be so discouraging seeing so much lunacy and seeing all the things that we've seen and will continue to see it and can just feel like what the heck is going on. But when you realize, no, this is the way that he, this is the way that he separates not only the wheat and the chaff, but this is the way that he, he strengthens the bonds of love between those who would love him and those whom he loves. This is precisely the way he does it. Because listen, do you really believe, do you like, do you really believe that he, that he will rise, that he will raise you from the dead? Do you really believe that he will reward every man according to his deeds? I do, I do. And God help me, you know? Cause when my time comes, May God give me the strength to, to, to stand in the firmness that I'm standing in now in comfort. May God give me that strength. But like, to me, this is, I see his hand in all of this. He's allowed all of these judgments and all these temptations to come because, you know, the work I was reading, you know, St. Simeon, the New Theologian, he says this great work I would encourage anyone to read is, the first created man by Saint Simeon the theologian. Um, man, I, I just 
little side note, um, the fathers are so great. I mean, you read the fathers and it's just, you become, you, you start partaking in this divine richness. Anyways, the first created man sings something with the theologian. It's incredible. Um, but, you know, and he, he says about how, you know, the son came that we would be partakers of that divine nature. And <clears throat> the problem is, is that with all the, um, with all the kind of um, easy access to all this good orthodox stuff, but it's all good. I mean, we're a part of that, right? Which maybe on the lower end, I don't know, but like, you know, we're, we're a part of that good content. It's like people can forget the profundity of what's being said, like, which gets us back to the father. But, and this is my big thing about the father, like, how can you think about, discuss, read about the fact that the creator of all things visible and visible has made way for you to call him father? How can that just be, oh, that was great, let's get pizza. Like, it's just, it's so beyond, right? And so this brings you to the sun and it's like, this, this maker of all things is, we're not talking about Zeus. You know, we're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about some capricious God that just like, you, he could care less whether you live or die. Like, that was the reality for the whole world up until the Christ revealed the Father to us. Mm -hmm. And we were, all, the whole world, all the nations were in the bondage of the devil primarily through self-destructive, sick practices and, 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 and ways of being, darkness. We've been freed from that and we've been able to call ourselves sons and daughters of the Most High. Like, when you begin to understand that you can not simply just I don't even like the word transcend <clears throat> because, you know, our boy Elon and, and Grimes and all of them, it's just like, they're down with the transcendence too, but the, it's a transhumanism. Yeah. Trans so for me, I like to emphasize the fact of like, we are, we've been given the opportunity to really discover what it means to be human. Because that's the greatest thing is to truly become human, not to transcend it, but to become it be pure a pure human to be purified to be purified to be yes yes this is uh, this is it's interesting father what you're saying because now it's, it's wonderful like now i'm realizing the that really that 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 pathway of love is i'm understanding salvation as the pathway of love it's occurring to me right now like just even as you're speaking going back through all the ways, all the ways that I was saved and brought to Christ, like in a real way, like what you're saying. <laughs> and of all the people, I think people could probably look at my life and be like this guy. And people do believe me. They're like <laughs> this guy. And, and like being truly neck deep in, the in the devil's quicksand man you know what i mean and just like but from that all the the voices in the head is like no it's all good it's all good everything is great like this is it this is a, this is a, this is where anybody would want to be mm -hmm. and yet and yet being saved and it's like only only someone who who loves you could save you in that. And I mean, I was saved mystically. I've been saved yeah. mystically. That's for sure. There's no question. I get it, you know? I mean, and yeah, that pathway of love, I, I, I'm start, it's starting to become clear to me now, even like, though, so thank you, Father. No, I mean, honestly, I, I hate to say this because it's, it's whatever, it's super dangerous, but, um, you know, I've just, St. John Maximovich, he talked about, you know, don't look for miracles, don't look, but, you know, look for repentance, you know. Um, but I want to just say this, you know, it's like grace, 
grace can, does, and, and, and will change you. And I don't just mean like make you a better moral person. I mean, it'll begin to change you. It'll begin to change your body. It'll begin to change the way you orientate yourself to your body. It'll change the way that you orientate yourself towards the quote unquote material world. Food, sex, um, the, the elements, the seasons, like it, it will change you. Um, and God forbid you begin to experience things that are even you know, kind of beyond your understanding. But none of those things really matter in the light of, of his love. And I say that because those moments, uh, those moments of grace where, you know, you're aware of his presence uh, and just you've never felt love like that before. Um, yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's nothing compared to what we will see when we see him face to face, no longer, you know, veiled. Um, I mean, that, that path of love, it, <laughs> yeah. So that, that's like, that's, that is the thing. Um, and it's so much so that like, you know, everything else that you can and do experience because there's so much beauty in the church. I mean, I don't know anything else more beautiful than, than the church, right? And, and like aesthetics and, and, and aesthetics have been my life, you know? It's, it's, been my, it's been my business, it's been my life, it's been my field of study. Um, there's, I mean, yeah, so. Andrew, I thought you had something. No, I mean, <clears throat> I don't really think we have time to get into the only begotten because that's its own. That's, you know, um, you know, I think that that probably from what I understand is a pretty chief cornerstone of, you know, like heresy. I mean, because was Christ created or was he begotten? You know, like where what is that like you know uh, so are we are we created sons yes so we're created sons uh-huh we're, but, we're sons okay. by adoption okay we're made sons we're made sons by adoption uh and we're made gods by grace but christ is christ so the trinity they they they're one essence right and so they share they share in all things um, except for what's unique to the person. So um, the father is Wait, the source. What's unique to each person? What does that mean? So the father is the source. Oh, you're got, oh, I got you. But, but the son, but the son is begotten and the spirit proceeds. And it's in those functions that there's, that there's a, their person um, their hypostasis, their person is 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 distinct, but they're they're distinct in their unit. They're they're unified in their distinctness, if that makes sense. You know, it's like that. The they are all uncreated, right? They are all eternal. They are all one, but the Father is the source, and the Son is begotten of, right? And the Spirit proceeds from. The father, the father is the source. Um, is this how we perceive the energies? Is that can we understand it that way? That that it's our description of how we perceive the the energies of God. The energies are are what we perceive of God. Period. So, God is unknowable in His essence, but His energies are how we perceive Him. So, that would that would applied to the spirit and the son as well so the and i know you're not i know you weren't saying this cyprian but to clarify for someone else the the, the son and the spirit are not energies of god 
right no i wasn't saying that yeah, That's i know, I know you weren't saying that but someone out there would be thinking that and so they are not image of god they are they are god fully but their energies we encounter and experience them through their energy so you know you no one no one you know has actually experienced the sun um s-u-n um and we know it because if you talk to them therefore they're alive therefore they've never encountered the sun because they've been burned up right so in that same sense you encounter you know the sun through the sun's energies it's it's rays of light and it's warmth right um that's 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 the energies but um we in regards of understanding that the that only begotten sun portion of it um I think it's really important to understand because this gets us back to this whole thing with like, he's the son of God, but not God, right? And, and these, these very clever ways in which the devil has tried to work through the machinations and the quote unquote logic of man, who, because man can't wrap his mind around something, therefore I must say it can't be true. Because if I can't understand it, then it means I can't master it. If I can't master it, then I'll destroy it you know, through heresy or through whatever. And that's, that's essentially what it boils down to. But yeah, that's kind of like part of that whole sickness thing then, because then it's like, if I can't master it, then it means that the power resides somewhere else. And if the power resides somewhere else, then maybe I'm pretty small. And then maybe there's something bigger than I am. Mm -hmm. And I so, Sorry. yeah, yeah. Which, I mean, it's like, it's like in Stalker. Remember in Stalker? We went and saw Stalker. We're at the end that, that they finally found the place. And the guy pulls out the pipe bomb. He's like, I got to blow it up. They've yeah. been, I don't know if you've seen it, Cyprian. It's a, who's that Russian director? Tarkovsky. Yeah, Tarkovsky. Oh, Tarkovsky. Uh, One of the greatest movies on spiritual life ever. So it's good. very, very, very. Oh, I'm watching it. I'm going to watch it. Yeah. It's two awesome. movies, two movies that are just, I'm sure there's others, but for me, like the two movies I've seen that have, profoundly demonstrated and, and laid out the spiritual life in a, in a very profound way magnolia and stalker i've seen magnolia i like that movie yeah, yeah. magnolia um Mine's yeah, get... Huckabees. what Huckabees? have you seen that i heart Huckabees. yeah oh i keep hearing applebee's you're not <laughs> oh no there's nothing oh my it's because I'm hungry. I don't yeah. know. I was just no, I heart Huckabees. No. But, about it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but so the whole thing is, is that they're it, blah blah blah. They're seeking this mystic place, and they're following this guy in Stalker. They're following this guy, and they finally get there. It's like a three-hour movie. In two and a half hours, in they finally get there. And uh, one of the first things that one of the guys does is pulls out a pipe bomb. He's like, yeah, I got to blow it up. And I don't remember what his reasoning for it was, but there was some encounter of the divine. And he's like, well, I can't have this. This can't be around. So I have to get rid of it. And that's the whole point of this room that they're trying to get to. And that, uh, that really stuck out to me about that film. And I'm not quite like... I don't have the endurance to do stuff like that very often, but that movie really stuck out to me in that sense. I mean, there's like lots and lots of little things. Like he has like a, it's like a black shirt, except for like part of it's torn out. So you see this like white undershirt, like right there. And he's leading everybody through this extremely dangerous path. Like, I don't know, like there's lots and lots of stuff like that. But um, yeah, that, that speaks to that whole like, where does your power lie? I mean, what are you trusting on? And I mean, I see it all the time with people in sobriety, you know, like this is, you know, the limited experience I have with it is people who are truly reliant on, um, I guess, like logic and rationality, even as they enter sobriety, which is just so mind boggling that they can do that. I mean, I'm sure I did it to an extent, but they, they enter into it with this whole process of like, well, they're still looking for the same feelings that they had when they were using. They just don't, well, they want to get it a different way. 
a lot of times that comes out of chugging of Red Bull and lots of energy drinks and like, you know, candy bars and stuff like that. But then there's also people that like talked about truly missing the way that they feel that they felt when they were on like uppers, like insane uppers and their brain was so sharp and hyper-focused. And I would just be like, well, why is that important? Well, then I was in control. Then I could understand. Then I could logic. And I'm still trying to mimic that feeling. And it's like, I give you five years tops. Like there's just, there's got right. to they'll be, they'll be relapsing for sure. Yeah, that person got to be a whole perspective change. There has to be a, you know, an AA as much as watered down as it is now. And I'm not a big fan of what it is now. In AA, there's this whole, just give it something just something is bigger than you. That's like the little scrap, the little crumb that they want you to eat while there's this like giant, like table full of like wonderful food. But like, if you just eat this one little scrap, then you won't be so hungry. Just acknowledge that there's more people in the room here than you are. So therefore the room is more powerful than you are. And sometimes people can't even do that. They're just like, no, I'm still... So, I mean, who is truly your God at that point? Like if, if your ego is your God, if that's the direction you're still moving, that's fine. You can do that. It's just not going to work for very long. And in fact, you'll end up miserable. And the last thing I'll say is that I never finished it because goodness gracious, I could not finish that book. But Orthodoxy by J.K. Chesterton has this really amazing intro. G.K. Chesterton, G.K. Chesterton has this really amazing intro where he's talking about people often can misconstrue insanity as a complete lack of logic and rationality. And in fact, it's not, it's hyper logic and hyper rationality. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think of like lot, like insane, you think of like the Joker and that's like, that's the exception, not the norm. I mean, in reality, what two face, two faces are probably much better or the Riddler is probably a much better example of actual insanity because they're so, tight they're so like focusing on hypers it's like you know uh you're walking along and someone like adjusts their hat oh are they signaling to someone across the street you know yeah that's schizophrenia in schizo for schizophrenics everything has meaning so yeah. they apply logic to every single thing they give it all meaning yeah. i never thought of it like that before that's it that's it that's what i'm trying to say is that right there summed up very eloquently but yes and then how do you and and I think that this is the problem with the encounter with the mystical or the encounter with the divine. If you have no yes. experience with surrender. Yes. Because then you want to control. How do you how do you control this? To, I, I encounter I, there are specific people that I can think of in my mind who I encounter who I can't even have any discussion about spirituality yeah. or religion or orthodoxy. I can't have a discussion with them because all they want to do is like, they've got this box that they're going to like put it in and lock and lock it in with the cage. And now I'm in control of it. And it's like, bro, there's not, you know, I think um, a real nice insight to what you're saying is like the thing with schizophrenics and, 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 looking for pattern finding meaning and everything is that it's they're not wrong in in understanding that there is meaning in everything they're they the sickness comes when the meaning has something to do with them and that that's the thing that no one there's there's a profoundly deadly egocentrism at the center of, of schizophrenia where everything has to do has to come back to you it has to do with you. It involves you. Um, and that's the thing about the spiritual life is that you, you begin to see how profound it is that everything does have meaning. But what keeps you from going mad is that you realize and that's the power of humility. You realize that not everything has to do with you. There's a reason there's a pattern, but it's not about you. And thank right? God. Not every, you're not the center of everything because Again, you know, as I'm off to say, humility isn't thinking poorly of yourself, it's thinking less often about yourself. Yeah. And so people with schizophrenia, when you look at that, it, it just taking away the clinical term, but just with anyone who, um, and this is the problem again with people 
whether it's those who are wanting to approach orthodoxy as a kind of a better, a better mousetrap or um, those who are looking at it um, for anything other than, than the sun, <laughs> anything other than Christ is you, you know, this gets us back to the conspiracy theorist thing too. It's like, yeah, I can see, I can see the conspiracy. I mean, if you're a Christian, then you know, and you have to believe in conspiracy. They've been going on since, since, I mean, since the Garden of Eden, there was conspiracy, but, but the thing is, is like, you're not at the center of it and you cracking the code isn't at the center of it. And that's where the people who see the patterns and see, and see the, the meaning, that's the difference between those who get lost and those who are led to something, or I should say someone else due to the patterns that they recognize is when you begin to look and that's, that's one of the ways he saves us. He takes on that whole burden to where you are no longer are the, at the center of everything and, and everything rests on your ability to apply, you know, cognitive reasoning to these things. It's like you, you're able to like, if you were saying you surrender. Right. So Cause how can you, how can you change? I mean, this is what these conspiracy theorists, I'm like, okay, stop. <laughs> like, okay. I'm okay. I'm with you. Uh -huh. Got it. Okay. Got it. Now, but you're not changing. You're not doing anything. Right. You're not altering anything. You, you just, what do you just believe that if you get every single detail of this, that all of a sudden it stops? It's like, no, you're just the narrator. Right. <laughs> no. right. I mean, in my experience with like coming into it and being, you know, fairly, I mean, relatively uh, new to it is it's just like, well, congratulations. Like, good job, buddy you're you're now like you got woke up you're neo standing in a pool of your own poop and pee and you know like we're gonna have to clean you off and you can start being like whoa but it's like this we've been knowing this for a while like this is not that big of a deal buddy so yeah it's all right like, what's no sorry father i was just gonna say just yeah getting people to understand it's like yeah you're not wrong yeah like the connections you like you you've made them great but like then what yeah you know, then what because if it's going to be all about you making the connections i'm going to take a couple <laughs> steps back because your shelf life is going to be coming up pretty quick you're gonna you're gonna burn out and hit the end of the road real quick quicker than you think you know so no that's a fantastic point i mean like you're saying like to kind of speak to that point a little bit I think I made some kind of connection in my brain here and I don't know if I remember what it was, but I remember the very first time I ever saw the winter soldier um, at the very end when Robert Redford's dying and like his last words were like hail Hydra. I was like, that's the stupidest thing to die for. Like that doesn't make any sense. Like you gave your life for Hydra. Like you get nothing to the next life. Like why? Like that doesn't make there was some connection there I made in my brain, something about maybe he was like that because Hydra's so ordered. It's so like, we need to get everything down to the last, you know, it's fascism essentially. And it's like, that's like hyper, hyper sanity or yeah, it's the tower of Babel again, you know, it's, we, we're going to build something in such a way that we're going to send and we're going to, we're going to call God down. We're the trans the transhumanists the which trans is the transhumanism is coming into full view right now man yeah, yeah. full view just yeah. saying full that, view. one of the villains in that movie does anybody remember he's the the, the computer the computer guy who who oh my gosh not the computer remember. guy yeah it's Sorry. z i can't remember his name you know no, not Zemo. Uh, of course, I, I can't remember his name right now. The one time I need it, and like I'm muttering it in my sleep every night, but I can't remember it right now. But it's like when you like go to buy an album and you're like, well, I'm going to buy a CD. Which one's it going to be? And they're like, well, something you'd like. Well, I listen to music. Like, when do I listen? To right. Music? Like, I don't, I don't, can't think of one single band. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh i can't remember his freaking name it starts with the z he's the computer guy it's trans transhumanism because he uploads his entire consciousness into a robot body well and that's what they want well yeah i know but that's what that's I'm what saying. they want yeah 
that's the whole I gotta stop thinking about it. <laughs> that's the that's the end, that's the end of transhumanism. Well, yeah. Is is the uh is no more because but the thing is you can't upload your consciousness. You can't like you could have a facsimile, perhaps, of somebody, perhaps. Just but uh just for fun though, just for fun, right? There's that there's this one scripture in the, in the apocalypse. Oh, I know so, what you're about to talk about. This is dope. <laughs> well, when it talks about that men will seek death and it will escape them. Yeah. You know, and and I remember reading something about, I think this is I think this is our boy Elon was talking about this, but being able to have a yep. prison where yep. people would experience you know, decades of tor- whatever, like in, I think he said ten thousand years, Father. Yeah, yeah, ten thousand. I think he said ten thousand years. Yeah. yeah. What an epic number to use. It was Zola, by the way. Zola, okay. the name yeah. of the scientist. But that that whole piece of it, it's like it really it makes me shudder. It makes me shudder because. I don't even want to, I don't even know if it's the precipice anymore. It's just a matter of it's already been, we've already crossed over it. It's already been opened. We just. Martyrdom might be harder. I'm just saying, if we can simulate 10,000 years of torture. I mean, that's just, yeah, God help us, you know, so. Mercy. All right. So we're at two hours. So I'm going to give you guys just a second because my closing question, it's a little bit of a thinker. Okay, go ahead. But I, And I think that it's a good one though. And nothing's okay. written in stone, but okay. top three-ish albums from the 80s. Because I tried doing one that was like favorite album from the 80s, but I couldn't pick one. So I came up with three. So while you guys are thinking, I can just say my three really quick, which is I think I think honestly, I think I'm too young to pick uh three albums. I wasn't that retro. <laughs> I'd have to really think on this, but go ahead, go ahead with yours. If you if you can, it's all good. What about the 90s then or something? I don't know. I got mine, it's just combat rock by the clash. That's and cool. then um I would say Viva Hate by Morrissey. Mm-hmm. That's a good uh, one. But then you got the Smiths too. That's difficult. I would go still Fever Hate with Morrissey because that one really impacted me really heavy. And then, I mean, I mean, it's got to be Beastie Boys. I mean, License to Ill or License to Ill or Paul's Boutique. I think License to Ill is more indicative of the 80s than Paul's Boutique is, though. So if I had to pick a really like rocking 80s album, I think it had to be License to Ill. So Combat Rock, Viva Hate, mm-hmm. and License to Ill. Those would be my three. This is I'm not, this is a tough one for me because nothing's written in stone. No one's holding you to this. Well, mm, I would definitely say at first I would say I'd go with this with a more obvious one, but then like her other one is I I think it's it's a, it's a it's a better. Paul's album Boutique is a much better album than License to Ill. Yeah, I, so like. So in, I'm in the same category. So Kate Bush, the dreaming. Okay. But but most people will be more familiar with like Hounds of Love, but the, the dreaming was like, yeah, Kate Bush, the dreaming. Uh, and then I would say with that, um, Bauhaus, um, oh. Although this is kind of cheating because it's more like that's eighty one, I think it's like eighty one. I picked a movie from nineteen eighty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but like that singles collection from from Bauhaus, it, it was like uh, it's super good. Which one? Uh, Which then, one from Bauhaus? Um, it's like. It, it's a it's a classic it's like it's called the it's the double-sided singles it's like their collection from like it's like 79 to 83 but it's it's that second album just incredible. i'll allow it yeah uh man you know um 
I don't know. On, on the, I don't even know on that third one. I mean, those are. Well, there was an album. I, is there any good? Nothing, nothing set in stone. But there, <laughs> <laughs> there's this. I mean, it's just for me. It's so. It's such a definitive album. But um, this is what you want. This is what you get by a public image. Public image limited. Kyle. That was another like. I mean, I'm really dating myself right now because I. I mean, I. I'm. I am swimming in that that eighties. But that's a good time. It's a very good time. I'm I'm staying I'm staying out of this one because I'm realizing I'm even going through and I'm like I'm looking at all these albums and I'm like oh nineties nineties not never mind I'm staying out I'm staying out of the eighties but what I like you guys' choices. Like, I could pick three nineties right now. Oh, you, I'm not gonna we're we're not even gonna do it. We're not even gonna do it. <laughs> save it for next week. Save it for now. Astro Lounge. I'm just kidding. I have no idea if that's. Came Are out you today. kidding me? <laughs> yes, Astro I, Lounge. What is that? Astro <laughs> Lounge. That's one with like walking on the sun and All Star. It's my. Come I was on, man. Say. <laughs> come on. It's a good. Come on. It's what not. Like, it oh it's boy. Like, oh boy. It's like that's a know, good. That's a good place to end. <laughs> it's like what is? Oh, it's like oh, uh, Paige called it funnel cake. It's like funnel cake. You don't want it every day, but it's pretty good every once in a while. It's just like no, because every time I've had funnel cake, I go like, "Why'd I eat that?" Every time. Well, yeah. Every single time. Every Why'd time. And, it's uh, the, and put the the jelly stuff on it. Put the jelly. Yeah. And the powder. Yeah. Ugh. That's Smash Mouth, man. That's. Uh, all right. Yeah, that's all I got. Um, we still have the landing page, Royal Path mm-hmm. Network. Uh, check that out um i do want to say something really quick and this just came to my head there's like somebody in the comments that said something about like losing their job because of the vaccine Mm -hmm. um i don't know if everybody saw that but whatever i i'm sorry i don't have it up but her name maybe we could keep her in her prayer keep us and keep her in our prayers like it's uh, in the last the last episode i believe the one that just went up last week Yes, okay. that's where I believe it was. Yeah. So if we could go look, look. what her name is and keep her in our keep her in our prayer. Because she said it was directly Indeed. related to getting because she had like some kind of she had a prior existing condition or something like that. There was still like uh uh-uh. uh she's got children too, from what I understand. Right. Well, I can I can tell you I can tell you it right now. Yeah. Uh, per, perhaps perhaps I can. Yeah. So it was from the last one. And her name is uh, Angela. Angela. So, which is an appropriate name. <laughs> God help her. Yeah. So, anyway, um, I wanted to at least mention that I saw that and I didn't really want to post anything, be like, hey, this is Andrew. <laughs> I know it doesn't say Royal Path, it's, it's something different, but, um, but yeah, if we could, if we could pray for her. And then um, I don't think that there's anything else that i felt like i needed to say so again i never have i'm never gonna have anything so this is the it this is it this is the goodbye this is the end that's it thank thank you both <laughs> <laughs> that's it bye